And now, are you all caffeinated up and ready for operating systems? <laughs> okay, so some of you may have noticed a little bit of activity in the Arjupalit uh, Git repository in the last few months. And um, this is particularly due to uh, Siddharth and myself, also Mark Whitehorn has been helping a, a lot lately, working on um, shifting uh, our primary operating system on STM32 microcontrollers away from Nardex PX4 to Shibios. So um, the STM32 microcontroller is sort of the ubiquitous microcontroller uh, brand that is used on uh, most flight controllers, the vast majority of flight controllers. Um, not used on our Linux-based ones, but used on most of the, the other boards, the ones that most of our users are running. So here is a uh, classic flight controller, a Pixel 2 Cube. Thank you very much to Philip uh, for lending me this for this presentation. So inside this uh, lovely little piece of equipment is an STM32 F427, which is our uh, workhorse microcontroller that is used in most of the autopilots that um, ArduPilot users are using today. And we've been running NutX on that microcontroller for many, many years now. Um, so, this talk is about shifting us away from NutX and onto another operating system called Shibios. And this work was started by, by Siddharth, who's in the audience here today. It was lovely meeting uh, Siddharth for the first time this week. Uh, of course, I've known him for years online, but it's great to meet him face to face. All right, a little bit of history of where we've been with operating systems in Arduipilot. Uh, we started off on 8-bit AVR back in the days of the APM1, APM2. How many in the audience here have flown Arduipilot on an APM1, an original APM1? Quite a few. At APM2, of course, a lot of you would have. Um, so that was many, many years ago, 8-bit microcontrollers, um, and of course we were much more limited in the maths we could do. We had software floating point, uh, even doing 32-bit floating point numbers required quite a few CPU cycles, plus the CPU was running relatively slowly. Um, we added the AP HAL abstraction at the time when we started switching across to 32-bit microcontrollers and the STM32. Uh, originally added by Pat Hickey, um, and it has become the core of ArduPilot's interface into the operating system and the hardware. And so uh, we've now got many different AP HALs, but it provides a common interface that allows ArduPilot to talk to the operating system and the hardware. So lots of HALs have appeared over the years. We've got HAL Linux, and we've got some amazing flight boards. I won't be talking about them much in this talk, but there have been a massive number of really brilliant flight boards come out of the last year based around HAL Linux. Um, HAL Quirt, not used very much, based as the uh, Qualcomm flight controller. HAL Siddle, which is used a lot, that's our software in the loop simulation HAL that interfaces to desktop computers, laptops, etc. HAL uh, VR Brain for the virtual robotics boards that are also based on NUTX but with a different flavour very similar to HAL PX4, and of course the venerable HAL PX4, which is what most of you are using in your everyday flying on the STM32 based flight controllers. So most users HAL PX4, um, we had a partnership with PX4 on NUTX for the development of that, and a lot of ArduPilot developers put in a lot of time to bring NUTX, uh, the PX4 firmware on NUTX up to scratch to the quality required for for ArduPilot, and using that we have supported the Pixhawk, the Pixhawk 2 Cube, the Pixracer, the Pixhawk 4 Pro, and a number of other derivative boards that are very, very similar to these baseline boards. Okay, so that's how we, we got to where we are today. So, how is Shibios? Um, we've actually been using Shibios for a number of years, uh, but we've been using it in our peripherals rather than in our main flight controller. And so we have a number of CAN bus peripherals that are based around Shibios, and that started with uh, Pavel, uh, who developed UAV CAN. He really liked Shibios. It was a good 
uh, basis for the uh, a real time operating system for CAN bus work. And so it's already been part of our community or on our radar for a while. Um, so that's particularly Pavel and John has put in a fair bit of work on those. Uh, John's also done some more bare metal type uh, CAN bus peripheral work. The Hal Shibios effort to make our main flight stacks, our main flight controllers run on top of Shibios was started just a few months ago uh, in late 2017 and started by Siddharth and uh, here in the audience and really aiming for smaller, faster HAL for our STM32 processors. We're starting to find that the PX4 NUTX HAL was really holding us back. It was limiting what we could do with the processors. We weren't taking full advantage of them. Uh, it was a major bottleneck. Now, we prepared for this work um, you may remember a major effort starting about 18 months or so ago to switch us to internal drivers from PX4 drivers. Because originally when we partnered with PX4, we developed device drivers for the STM32 running within the PX4 framework. But their driver framework is complex, difficult to work with and very inefficient. Um, it does a lot of, lot of work inside interrupt handlers which reduces bus parallelism. There's a number of technical reasons why the driver architecture really doesn't suit us when we're aiming for very high efficiency in Pilot. And so uh, 18 months or so ago, we started switching uh, our flight controllers, um, our HAL PX4 and our drivers to use the device drivers that we originally developed for HAL Linux. So we wrote device drivers against our abstract HAL SPI and I2C driver framework for HAL Linux, and those same drivers without modification could run against HAL PX4, um, shifting our device drivers to the, our own um, repository rather than relying on the PX4 firmware repository for device drivers. And that gave us an enormous speed boost because we were no longer doing a lot of work in interrupt handlers. We uh, started using DMA for SPI operations, so we got bus parallelism where we have uh, transfers from sensors happening in parallel with multiple sensors. We shifted across to having a separate thread in the RTOS per bus. That made an enormous difference to our efficiency. So already, and that is all out in stable releases, every stable release of Pilot now is using our internal device driver system, not using the PX4 firmware device drivers. And that paved the way for the next step, which is to cut off the PX4 firmware NARDX stuff completely and move to HAL Shibios, which is what we're now doing. Um, there was other motivations we wanted uh, to start supporting smaller boards. And um, small is where it's at at the moment for many people. There's a lot of people in our community that like the idea of absolutely minuscule boards and uh, boards that are also very low cost. Some of our partners in Pilot really want very low cost boards. And it turns out that the flash in the STM32 microcontrollers is a major contributor to the part cost. So if we can fit in a uh, STM32 with just half a mega flash, then that is a big advantage in million plus volumes for some of our partners. And, at the, and that's really worthwhile. So we weren't going to be able to do that on, on top of the HAL PX4 with NUTX, whereas we can fit in half mega flash and fly a copter in those, scale, those sizes with Chibios. It's a much smaller, more efficient operating system. So that were the motivations behind working on it. Um, so I now talk a bit more about what's, what's happening. By the way, feel free to interrupt and ask questions during the talk. Um, very happy for this to be a conversation with the audience. So just shout out or put your hand up. Uh, yes, Philip. I was going to say that uh, GPS you've got hanging off there. Yes. Is actually running Chibios. Oh, very good. Okay. Yes. So that's, we're, that's a here two. Right. So these here two GPS running Chibios. So we've got Chibios already in our world, just not on our main uh, flight controller until very recently. All right. Now a little bit about the Chibios Artos uh, for those of you who don't know it. Uh, it was started in 2007. Uh, the lead developer is Giovanni De Sirio. 
and um, he's been a incredibly good maintainer for the operating system over the past 10 years. The current stable release is version 18.2.0, released just a few days ago. Now, we're currently using a slightly earlier release. Uh, we haven't uh, rebased on the latest releases, but we probably will fairly soon. So uh, the release we're using is from probably about six or eight months ago, roughly, Sid? Uh, October 1. October, so, uh, October the 1st. Okay, so a number of months old. So it's, it, they're doing fairly regular stable releases, and we're a few months old on that but we expect to, to rebase up to a new recent one soon. The license of Shibi Offset is GPL v3, but um, uh, Giovanni owns the whole copyright and he also offers commercial licenses to companies that don't want to ship products based on GPL v3. That's not relevant for the Argypilot community. We're perfectly happy with GPL v3, but um, there are some other commercial users that use it under a different license. It is a very widely used and respected uh, real-time operating system. Its focus is on efficiency and small size, uh, very, very compact. So it, it actually supports down to 8-bit microcontrollers, 16-bit and 32-bit microcontrollers. And um, you can, in fact, strip it back to be the complete flash size running on a small microcontroller of around one kilobyte. So really, really small operating system. It can be used for bootloaders and very flash limited ones. Obviously, ArduPilot isn't going to fit in one kilobyte. Uh, that would be a challenge. But uh, we can at least, you know, we can, we're not getting a lot of overhead from the operating system by, by switching to Shibios. It has a very active community and forum uh, and a well-organized one. It supports a very wide range of microcontrollers. Now, our interest is principally in the STM32 series, but it does actually support a whole lot of other types of microcontrollers, which offers some interesting possibilities for the future of ArduPilot on different types of microcontrollers. And porting to those, uh, if you base on Shibios, uh, uh, working on a different type of microcontroller that Shibios supports is uh, uh, relatively easy. Uh, plus, if you need to port Shibios to a new operating system, because it's so small and uh, such a simple layer, porting it to a new operating system is a much simpler task than it is for other many other real-time operating systems. Uh, so within the STM32, it supports a huge range of the STM32 microcontrollers, all the way down from the, the F1, F0 series up to the uh, the F7 series, the new ones, um, and we will be taking advantage of that uh, in ArduPilot. The main site is at www.shibios.org, um, so lots of information there. There is very extensive API documentation, plus I would highly recommend the book, Shibios RT 3.0, The Ultimate Guide. Uh, it's an online book, it's free, um, I, it's very clear very clearly explain the concepts in the operating system. So if any of you want to go deeply into how basically the principles of RTOSs and how Shibios fits in within the general uh, range of RTOSs available, I would highly recommend you read that online book. It's a very good read, very clearly explained. Um, and in fact, from reading that book, I learned a few things that are able to improve our performance considerably. All right. So Shibios structure, now this is an extreme simplification of the structure. My apologies to Giovanni in advance uh, for leaving out many of the important aspects of Shibios. Um, for, these are the aspects that are particularly important for ArduPilot. So it has this concept of an LLD for each peripheral, a low-level driver, plus it has a system LLD for the class of CPU. So the STM32, for example, has a LLD, low-level driver, that deals with things like the system clock and the setting up of basic operations, um, uh, interrupt handling, etc., for that CPU. Then there is an LLD for each peripheral type. So there's LLDs for UARTs, for USB, OTG connectors, for SPI, for I2C. And there's also variants of the LLD. So, for example, the, um, the I2C peripheral on an F4 STM32 is an older variant of the STM32 peripheral from the F3, 
And so you'll see that there is I squared C V1 and I squared C V2. And when you configure Shibios, it automatically selects. If you're on F3 series microcontrollers, it will select the V2 I squared C uh, uh, driver. If you're on the F4 series, it will uh, select the older V1 series. Then within that, it'll then select the stepping of those controllers. So there are different steppings of the I squared C controller to deal with the different bug fixes in the controllers over the years. So it's a very logically organized structure for the drivers, but you'll run across these LLDs that just stands for a low level driver for a, a part of the uh, uh, a peripheral. Then there is the MCU driver for each microcontroller. And above all that, there's this operating system abstraction layer now called the OSAL. And that is an abstraction layer that allows you to have the API of Shibios on top of a different RTOS if you want to. So you could have another RTOS underneath if you need it and keep the operating system abstraction layer. It's a very, very thin layer that uh, allows you to abstract out the low level code from the higher level code. It also makes the, um, the boundaries between the different layers clearer in the, in the code. Um, it has the concepts of locking zones and task states, and these can be strictly enforced. And I'll be talking more about the locking zones and enforcement a little bit later. It is not a POSIX compliant operating system, but it does have many POSIX inspired features. So, uh, for example, some of the mutexes and threading concepts are very similar. They'll be familiar to you if you're used to a POSIX operating system, but they're not the same. And I would strongly recommend that you read the relevant chapter of the uh, ultimate guide to Shibios uh, before using a particular uh, set of APIs. Now, for, the, uh, for most people in the IG Pilot development community, all of this is hidden behind our HAL. So you just program against the IG Pilot HAL that then layers on top of HAL Linux or HAL Sittle or HAL PX4 or HAL Shibios. And the performance of each of them varies, but the API remains the same. So we have a, we can write high-level code without having to worry about these sort of details. All right, so HAL Shibios. So this is where we added another HAL to ArduPilot. And it's the new HAL with, of course, the same structure as all of our existing hardware abstraction layers. Um, it is a WAF, which is our, our new build system, Python-based build system. It's a wrapper around the Shibios makefile build. Now, the app, one of the really nice things about the Shibios build is it's very, very fast. Uh, blink and you'll miss it, the part where it builds the actual Shibios RTOS. Uh, a few seconds, uh, unlike NUTX, that takes really long time to build because it's a much, much larger code base. And so it calls out to the Shibios build, which builds just the portions of Shibios that we're using. And it works out, are we using USB? Do we have UARTs? And it builds the appropriate parts of that and creates a libch.a, a library that gets linked into ArduPilot, and that gives us our, our final binary. Um, we use this abstraction system, which we've added on top of Shibios, uh, to allow for hardware abstraction. And I'll be talking about that in a lot of detail later in the talk. Basically, it's a mechanism to make it easy to port ArduPilot to a new board using HAL Shibios. And this is one of the key things we want to achieve. I wanted to make it possible for a couple of things to happen. First of all, if somebody has got a board and they want to port ArduPilot to it, it should be a matter of a few hours, um, not a hire an expert for a month type process, which is what it tended to be with when we're on NUTX. Um, we want it to be something, and I also wanted it to be directly relatable to by a hardware person who's not necessarily uh, comfortable as a software engineer, a hardware person relating the schematic of the board they're building directly to the definition of what we have uh, in the operating system uh, for, the, for the HAL. So we'll show you more about that. We added a shared DMA abstraction layer. So Shibios has all the hooks necessary to be able to do DMA sharing, um, but uh, we added that as an extra layer, just a few hundred lines of code to make it possible to share DMA channels. And again, I'll talk a bit more about the shared DMA because it's fairly important for the performance we end up getting. 
Um, and we use DMA for all peripherals when possible, when the hardware can do it. And that is a huge step forward for us. One of the things that has been a real problem with ArduPilot on PAL PX4 has been the companion computers. People often want high rate um, communication to their companion computer, and they may be communicating at, say, a megabit or so. Uh, under NUTX, all of the transmission of bytes uh, across a UART, every single byte is an interrupt. And that interrupt is relatively expensive which means you can use a huge proportion of your CPU just talking to your companion computer, let alone talking to all the other peripherals. And while you're handling that interrupt, everything else stops. That's why it's called an interrupt. Stop everything, handle this byte. You've done, whew, handle that byte, another byte. And when you're running at a megabit, that's an awful lot of interrupts per second. Um, with Shibios, that's all we've done with DMA. And so we basically tell the DMA controller, we have this packet we want to send, this 200 byte packet. Call us when you're done, right? Send the 200 bytes and Shibios says, done that, you got anything more for me? And it sends more. That's the way we do it. And all of these DMA operations are going on in parallel. So it's like we've got a little parallel computer. The DMA engine is a specialized little microcontroller in a, in a sense inside the main microcontroller which is specialized at copying data around from memory to memory, memory to peripheral, peripheral to memory. And we're mostly doing peripheral memory, memory to peripheral, so we're basically sending to and from and we use that really extensively in <coughs> ArduPilot. All right, uh, another thing I actually forgot to put in the slides, a better use of CCM memory. Processes like this in this cube have a specialized area of RAM called CCM memory, core coupled memory. In this particular one, it's 64 kilobytes. And when we were using HAL PX4, the CCM memory was just another lump of memory and it was treated as ordinary memory. It, we only, the only special thing we did is you can't do DMA from CCM memory. So it was a, we had to have a special case if we were sending data from CCM memory out to SPI or UART, we had to copy it somewhere else first, right? So on HAL PX4, CCM was a burden because we had to worry about, we can't do DMA from this, so we've got to copy it into a bounce buffer. On Shibios, CCM is an enormous boost. And the, the thing about CCM and the reason why CCM can't be used for DMA is that it's its own memory bus and normally, when you're doing DMA from memory and the CPU is doing some maths calculations on memory, for example, if Paul's EKF is doing a whole lot of calculations and it's um, filling in elements of a covariance matrix, this great big lump of memory, right, then Paul's maths is limited by how fast he can get data into and out of this great big matrix, right? Uh, tends not to be actually floating point limited, is more limited on memory bandwidth. Now, when you have a DMA going on, then the DMA and the CPU, the floating point operator, floating point calculations, memory accesses, are fighting for memory bandwidth. So while the DMA is happening, the EKF gets slower. And that's why we've often had difficulty benchmarking things like the EKF, because Paul says, this lump of math sometimes takes 50 microseconds, sometimes takes 300 microseconds. And the difference is, is there multiple DMA operations going on fighting over the memory bandwidth of this microcontroller, right? So how do we turn it around and make this an advantage? When we use HAL Shibios, we have a new API in the HAL that says, allocate memory, we want it to be fast memory. Right? Or allocate memory, we would like it to be DMAable memory. Right? So the EKF allocates all of its state structure and its stack from CCM memory, which means it is never slowed down by DMA. That means that Paul's profiling task gets much easier because he no longer has to worry about the, the speed of his maths varying depending on some SPR operation going on in the background. So much more consistent. Plus, it's just done faster, much, much faster, and much less timing jitter. And so we're basically turning that to our advantage, and we, we choose which pieces of ArduPilot are located in CCM, 
and which pieces of Pilot are located in normal memory and we choose the ones that want to get in and out to peripherals a lot because Paul's EKF doesn't write, doesn't need DMA access to a UART, right? But the device drivers do, so they run in DMAable memory, put the EKF and the main stack and the navigation controllers or Lennox controllers, they run in CCM, which means they get full bore on the CPU while the DMA goes on the background. Everyone understand the, the setup there? All right, that by itself made a huge difference to our performance. Okay, so now hardware definitions. So we had this problem that porting to a new board was hard. Um, people would say, oh, I want to support this board in Arduino," and I think, oh, groan. There goes weeks of effort. There goes, you know, if I volunteer to do this, it's going to be hard, unless it's a microcontroller and an architecture we already support. You've got to edit dozens and dozens of files all over. Now, PX Maddox actually has what is generally considered quite a good structure for adding new boards. It's a very logical, hierarchical structure, but it is still quite a lot of work. And there's lots of little pieces of the code you've got to get right. You've got to make sure that, that those changes don't impact any of your other boards. So the cross-testing of all of your existing boards is quite difficult. So what we wanted to do with Hal Shibios is to contain all of the information about a new board in one file, right? And so that file is only touched by that the build for that board, so you know it can't impact anything else. Plus, we wanted the file format to be friendly for hardware makers. And we wanted them to be able to, when they're designing the board, to actually compile the firmware for that board before they have built the first physical device, so we can then give them a report on how they're going to do in terms of the allocation of peripherals and whether it's actually going to work. All right, so this is so how have we done it? Um, we've created this concept called hwdef.dat, single file to define the hardware setup of a board. Then we have a Python script that processes hwdef.dat and it generates the Shibios configuration, right? So now, but we made it, so it generates it in a human readable fashion. So you can go through and read it and check it if you understand the Shibios, you've read the Shibios book, you understand what it's doing. But for most people, they don't have to. And it also, this is the other part, pointing to a new board is involved a lot of time um, staring at data sheets. I don't know how many of you have read STM32 data sheets, you know, thousands of pages of data sheets. Well, wading your way through those, it's quite an, quite an effort to understand. So, understand what you need to extract out of it to port to a new board. So, we automated that. And we actually extract database, we extract tables out of the STM2 data sheets so that the Python scripts have access to the necessary tables so they can automatically fill in the information you need without the person writing the board having to know exactly which, um, you know, what alternate function a pin is, what DMA channels it has available. That's sorted out by the Python script. So I'm going to have a, this is an example. Now, I don't know if that's readable enough to everyone. Yeah. Readable enough? Okay. So this is an extract from the FMU V3. So this Pixel 2 Cube, this is an FMU V3 architecture in the nomenclature of, of our community. And this is an excerpt from a piece of the FMU V3 hardware definition.dat file, just to give you an idea of the flavor of it. It's not complete, but it, just an idea of how it works. We start off at the beginning of saying MCU, and we say what the Shibios microcontroller class is, plus which database file, in particular F F427, the database file we are using from the, um, the, the one that I've talked about with the auto generation of the database files. Um, we say what, what is the oscillator frequency. We can't work that out automatically, right? That is a choice of the hardware designer. Um, some of them are in the eight megahertz clamp and some of them are in the 24 megahertz camp. And it's like VI and Emacs, it seems, you know, as to which one is uh, Windows and Mac. Um, so, this particular one chose a 24 megahertz crystal. I'm sure there's other reasons, you know, that's all hardware stuff. Phil? Uh, if you want to GPS to work, you're in the 24 megahertz camp. Okay, right. So, 24 <laughs> megahertz camp is for better GPS reception. Okay. So, um, 
This particular one uses a 24 megahertz crystal. Then we're adding a USB device. Now these things look a bit weird. We're saying that pin, port A, pin 11, PA11, which is the standard nomenclature people use when they have the schematic up. You bring the schematic and you say, you know, PA11 has a little black line going out over here to your USB port, right? These letters here are straight from the data sheet. That is an OTG FSDM pin. And that's what it's called in the STM32 data sheet. Right, so that's, that's the label. And it's part of the peripheral OTG1. The Python script that processes this looks up the database, checks that this pin can do that, right, because not every pin can do every operation. Each pin has a set of up to 15, usually five or six, possible operations it can do, right? Alternate functions, they're called. It looks up and makes sure it can do it, and then from the table works out what its alternate function is and automatically programs the, um, the pin to be the right type when it boots, right? So you just say, that pin does this, this pin does that, and that's the way the hardware definition file works. Here is a UART. So UART 2 for telemetry 1, it's on port D pin 3, port D pin 4, port D pin 5, port D pin 6, and it's got the... Uh, the, the CTS, RTS, transmit and receive. So we've got flow control. And the script automatically notices, hey, you've got some flow control going on here. I'll automatically turn on flow control. Right, so you've got flow control available because you've defined a pin for it. If you haven't defined a pin for it, then I don't need to borrow well, got flow control in this one. So it automatically works out whether you need to enable flow control capabilities in IGPILOT. Um, SPI bus. Here we have a clock and a MOS, MOS, MISO and a MOSI associated with SPI1 on PA5, PA6, PA7. And here's some PWM channels on these uh, pins and ports. And we've assigned them to motor numbers here, PWM1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. They're the six auxiliary channels. And we've also assigned them to GPIOs. That's because the auxiliary channels on this uh, board can double as GPIOs, either input or output, so we're assigning them the, the same numbers that we used in HALPX4, which means if you set the board uh, PWM count number, say, to 4, the upper two get automatically available as GPIOs for relays and all the other things, right? So it's the minimum information that the system needs from the designer of the board to create the port, okay? Uh, once that gets processed, I'll show you, uh, I'll skip out and show you what we end up with. And so, uh, build FMU v3 HWDEF. So, this is now, this here, it's a bit very hard to read. My apologies, I really should have a bigger font. This is the generated file with comments. This is auto generated from the HWDEF.dat. And it does, so it generates all the structures, etc., that IGPILOT needs to do the port. And it even does things like here, it's producing a report, which is really important for a board designer. This is saying that we have not managed to resolve DMA channels for three peripherals, right? So there's three peripherals, and you probably can't read them. They are uh, UART 8 receive, UART 7 transmit and UART 7 receive, which is like our debug serial ports. They're not the most important ports in the world. Um, those ones, it could not find a way to give them DMA. They're going to be interrupt driven. Okay? Now that allows the designer of the board, before he starts shipping or making the first products, to say, hmm, I really do want DMA on that one. I'm going to juggle things around, shift my pins around, rerun this script, and see what uh, which DMA channels I'm going to end up with. You can also assign DMA priorities. You can say in the hwdef.dat, I really want DMA on that pin, right? In which case, it will juggle things and say, okay, if you want it, that means this one doesn't get it, right? Because there's limitations in the hardware as to what DMA channels can be assigned to what peripherals. And that's represented, I'll just show you this, this database, um, libraries, AP, how... Should be aspect. I'll, what I'll do is I'll show it here on a window with a big font so you can see it. APM Shibios, uh, libraries AP, how Shibios script, uh, uh, 
hardware dev script stm32427.py. This is the table that is automatically generated from the data sheets, right? So what it's done out of the data sheet, it has taken the STM32 data sheet, DM00071990, those incredibly, you know, clear names of data sheet files that ST loves. Um, and it extracted from that data sheet for the F427 and 42, uh, 427, 429, and it has created this table, which tells us that ABC1 can either be on the second DMA controller first uh, channel, first stream, or the second DMA controller fourth uh, stream. It can do either one of those, right? That's all it can do. If you want ADC inputs, you've got to use one of those two DMA channels, and that's it. And then it says that for each different peripheral, it's got which possibilities all the way down. Some of them can do three, some of them do two. There's one there. Uh, TIM1 channel two, TIM1 channel one, can be on three different DMA channels. You've got more choices, right? And Sid wrote a Python script that then juggles things to produce the optimal uh, DMA channel layout. Okay, then further down in this data database, here's our alternate function mapping. This is, again, extracted from the data sheet. We see that PA0 can either be TIM2 channel 1 or TIM2 ETR or TIM5 channel 1 timer, the TIM is timer, PA, TIM8, ETR, etc. This is what the hardware can do. So it validates your design and generates the Shibios configuration at the same time automatically. And then further down, it defines your ADC mapping, chug, chug, chug through all this generated, saving you lots of reading of complex data sheets. Here's our ADC mapping. We can see which pins can be analog to digital controllers and which pin number they end up on. Uh, as far as the input pin number, which turns up in our things like uh, bat, volt, pin, right? That's these numbers here, okay? So that's all generated. So while I'm here, I'll just skip out and show you how that's done. So um, I'm going to revise selection. So what I'm going to do here is I've got a set of this is an example here where I've got Tabula. Now we're using this system called Tabula, which is a um, system for extracting PDFs. So I've loaded the PDF, the data sheet of the STM32F427 into Tabula, and there's the tables that many of you would know and love or hate, right, from reading the data sheets. Tabula has automatically found those tables, right, and is then displaying them ready for extraction. And you can say just auto detect tables. It then uh, is able to export that. And sorry, but I haven't got the server running at the moment, so we can't export. It exports it to CSV files, which are then processed by our Python scripts to generate that output. Everyone clear on, on how that goes? And there's some a little bit of there's a little bit of documentation explaining that inside Hal Shibios. Okay. So back to the back to the talk. Um, back to that, and, okay, microcontroller support. All right, so and we extract stuff from the STM32 data sheet. We've currently extracted the database files for the F427, the F405, and the F412. There's going to be an F7 coming shortly, uh, because um, Philip has decided that 7 is the new black, and so we're going to have some F7s. The new red. The new red. The 7, <laughs> seven is the new red. So we're going to have some sevens coming along shortly, and multiple sevens, because we've got other people going to do other different sevens, seven, seven, six, nine, seven, four, fives, various other triple digit seven numbers, and we'll just add those and then use the same system to auto-generate the ports to those um, new uh, microcontrollers. And the hardware um, is already in there. I'm sorry? And the hardware def is already in there. He's already written the hardware definition for it. So that's how we do microcontroller support. Um, shared DMA, I've already talked a fair bit about this. Um, you, you can't always assign exclusive DMA. So we, we have some tweaking things, some, some optimization options in the hardware definition file. And I'll just show you an example of that. Um, if I go into the Skyviper uh, 
V2450. I'll show you this little hardware definition file because it's quite interesting. And you can see down the bottom here, is that readable to people or bigger font to get? Yeah, readable? Cool. Okay. It's saying D DMA priority SPI2 underscore star. So both transmits a wildcard pattern. It's saying transmit and receive an SPI2, really important we get absolute DMA priority. That's the radio, right? That's for talking to the radio to the RC control. Timing on that uh, radio link is absolutely critical, right? Because your real-time timing constraints synchronized with the transmitter for an SPI radio. So we're saying, we want priority. So this gets priority. You can list as many as you like, and they're in priority order. Anything you don't list gets the lowest priority, okay? Then we say, DMA no share. I don't want to share DMA. I don't even want this to be top priority. I don't want anyone else using my channel, right? I want to hog it, okay? So we're not sharing on that one. And the other part that I wanted to show you in here is this is a derived board, right? This Sky Viper, this is the Sky Viper V2450. It's based on the FMU V3 architecture. And it may not look it, but these two guys are brothers, right? Running the same microcontroller with the same pin architecture, okay? Both designed by Philip. So... Um, but this one has a lot less things hanging off it than this one, a lot less peripherals. And so what we can do is we can, we can tell it under PX4, help PX4, you just put up with having all those peripherals there in the code using up resources, DMA channels, etc. Under Shibios, you say, this is the V2450 hardware def dot dat. And the, we start by saying include dot dot slash FMU3 V3 hardware dev. Start with FMU V3. Start off with that, and then we're going to modify it. Then we're going to say, we don't need UR8. We don't need these pins. We don't need those pins. We don't need CAN bus. Just turn all that off. Release all those resources. Uh, we don't need UAV CAN. We don't need the IO, no IO microcontroller. Get rid of that. We don't need a micro SD card, don't need that, don't need logging, don't need terrain following. We're going to rearrange the order of the UARTs, the order that they get presented to the user, twiddle those around a little bit to suit this little guy. Uh, then we're going to say, hey, we want to turn on RC input with AP radio so we can fly it with a transmitter, and we're going to override the GPIOs for radio reset and interrupt. We're going to go and change some of the definitions in Arducopter. So in the hardware definition file, we are saying, hey, we want toy mode enabled in Arducopter, and we want the arming delay seconds to be zero, and we want land start altitude to be seven, seven meters, and we want the land detector maximum cell to be two. That's, so instead of doing the APM config patches, you can stick it in the hardware definition file and say, I want to tweak things a little bit, right? But isolate it in a file just for this board. Then we're going to add three more SPI devices that aren't in FMU v3. So there's um, a, uh, two radio types and the Pixar flow optical flow sensor. And we put it on the right pin, right? So we're adding extra SPI devices. And finally, we're doing the priorities of DMA. So I didn't have to redefine the whole file from scratch. I started with FMU V3 and said, FMU V3 with some tweaks. And we now have an optimized configuration for this one which doesn't need any DMA sharing, all the other peripherals aren't even uh, compiled, let alone allocated, saving memory and CPU resources, etc. And hey presto, uh, very quickly we have an optimal setup for this particular copter. And I'm expecting that's going to happen a fair bit for vendors making custom boards. They just don't have anything connected to that UART. Why use up the resources for it? All right. So, back to, back to this. Um, okay, bonus features. So, um, control strings, vendor IDs. Uh, we've made it that um, every device gets a unique USB identifier based on the STM32 serial number. So if I show this little board here, and I look at what's in dev serial by ID, this is the old 3DR one, because this is currently, because my next demo is performance, and I'm showing the HAL PX4 versus Shibios. It's currently running HAL PX4. That's the old 3DR one. When I reboot this into Shibios, you'll see it change, and it'll actually have the serial number in there. But vendors can override 
those USB IDs. So if Hex or Elab or anyone else making their own hardware, they want their own identifier. And I would highly recommend a web URL in your USB. So when people have the device, they plug it in, they see, oh, support for this board to the following URL. You can put arbitrary strings in there, right? Really handy. To, and have your own URL customized, your own vendor ID, product ID, without having to dive into the guts of NUTX to change things, right? In your hardware definition file, you can override these things. Okay. Um, we, the include system we've already talked about for cut down boards, it's also much, much faster builds than with HAL PX4, right? Because it's such a lightweight operating system. Okay, big thing, performance. Now this is actually a posting uh, from uh, a couple of weeks ago by Matt, who's been doing the, um, the master, solo on master um, effort. And this is solo on master. Now, this, this performance, just explain these numbers. So these are not from me. I'll show you the numbers myself on this board, even better than this. This is with NUTX and PX4. And this is after we've rewritten all the drivers and we've already got the DMA going and all the performance improvements, we squeezed as much as we could get out of PX4 and NUTX, right? We really, really pushed it to its limit. And this is what we ended up with on a solo. So out of, this is every 10 seconds, there are 4,000 loops. So out of 4,000 loops, 1,300 of them are over time by more than 500 microseconds. The worst case ones, we're getting, we're supposed to be 400 hertz on copter, we're supposed to be looping at 2,500 microseconds, we're getting loops of 8,000 microseconds, 7,000, right? Which basically is a major pain for Leonard and Paul because we're not fulfilling our promise to the, uh, to the maths people in the group saying we're going to be running at this rate. Instead, we're all over the place like that drunken plane flyer. <laughs> um, and we can see this is the standard deviation. We can also see the average loop times is getting on the solo. Even after all of our optimizations, the average loop time was 2900 microseconds, 2950. So we're not even on average hitting 400 hertz, right? And this is vastly, vastly better than anything we got before we started doing our own device drivers. So it was just hopeless with that when we were using the PX4 device drivers. The standard deviation of the loops was 600 microseconds, standard deviation. Now this was from a couple of weeks ago before we did the latest round of improvements from Sid and I, and he tried it and he gets this. So he's getting a standard deviation now of like 80 microseconds. He's getting one or two, worst case five misses instead of 1300 per 10 seconds, right? And we're getting maximum loop times of maybe 3100, 3300, okay? True. Yep. I misunderstand that. How can you get five misses with the maximum shorter than that? Oh no, that's what what's what's the maximum? So there are but five loops that were above three thousand. Right. In this particular case, because at four hundred hertz our threshold is twenty percent and so it's five hundred microseconds. Right. Alright. So we end up there are five loops that were above three thousand microseconds in this case. Now we were delighted by this. And he was posting about how delighted he was. But of course, Sid and I think, that's not good enough, <laughs> right? We've got to do better than that. So, what yeah, I'm going to do yeah. now is give, you know, risky live demo of the latest stuff. And so what I'm going to do here is, this is, this is a, this particular one here. Now, I've got a number of cheats in this. In particular, I've done fake GPS to get perfect GPS lock in this room, right? using the fake 3D U-block stuff. Where's Michael? Cringe, cringe? Yeah. Yeah, cringe, yes. So fake GPS, second thing I've done is I've forced magnetometer fusion on the ground in the EKF, EK2 and EK3, and I'm running four EKFs in parallel, two EK2s and two EK3s, all four running at once with three IMUs, right? So this is ridiculous, okay? This is the, you want it to max it out. And so what I'm showing here, it's a bit hard to see. I might actually pop this down and just show it on the terminal uh, with a nice big font, and you'll see it every 10 seconds. So this is with the PX4 build, and it should start showing some. I'll put it in loiter. Okay, and there's, there's the first report we're getting out. So this is with the PX4 build. Now, it's not communicating to a ground station or to the companion computer, because we don't have the companion computer plugged in. I did bring this along. This is my solo test rig 
Um, but uh, it, it's got the companion computer, but it doesn't have the fast sampling I wanted to turn on, the 8 kilohertz sampling that I wanted. But you can see here that it's getting 352 misses every 10 seconds, maximum of 5 milliseconds, standard deviation of 338. All right. Now, what I did uh, early this morning was at Sid and I, despite us talking about performance and things, our aim has actually been stability. Because there's no point in us having a new RTOS unless it's rock solid. We can't have vehicles falling out of the sky, then being fast is no good if they fall out of the sky. So we have had every safety mechanism in Shibios turned on. We've had all the debug checks, and I'll just show you a bit about that. Um, so in Shibios, the, um, this is the state diagram in Shibios, right? A thread can be in these states and there's transitions between them, and you make system calls to shift between them. We've currently got every safety turned on, so every time any, any time any operating system call happens, any time any state transition, it's doing paranoid checking and asserts on everything. It's doing paranoid checking on, on the stack, on, on everywhere. So and it's designed to crash deliberately and uh, with a debugger backtrace if any of it violates any of the rules that make the RTOS safe. That's what we have that we're giving to people to use at the moment. But all those checks, they're not the production checks. You don't actually want an assertion falling out of the sky when you're flying. If you really hit one of those asserts while flying, you're better off keeping to try to fly, right? So, for this morning, I've turned off those checks, okay? And so I'm going to, for the first time, demonstrate what it looks like. So all I did to turn off those checks is APHAL, Shibios, uh, hardware depth, FMU V3, the hardware depth for that. Down the bottom here, I have defined GBOS debug system state check false, debug enable checks false, debug enable asserts false, debug enable stack check false. You can do this per board. So in your board, you can make it paranoid while somebody else's board is unaffected just by putting these defines in your hwdef.dat. So what I'm going to do now is upload Argicopter onto this same board and show you the results uh, running, as I said, four EKFs, so, so loading it now, four EKFs with MagFusion enabled on the ground, full GPS lock, running loiter, um, everything flat out with three IMUs enabled with fast sampling, eight kilohertz sampling. Basically, as nasty as we can be to this thing. And it's gonna boot now, I'm going to stick it in loiter so that, you know, a Leonard's controller gets a bit... I need to wait for GPS lock to get in loiter. Right. And so you'll see it as mode loiter. So now you start seeing the results, okay? And it's a little bit at the beginning, but then watch what happens after the next 10 seconds. Tilt alignment complete, perf there. Zero misses out of 4,000. Standard deviation from, from 2.5 milliseconds is 6 microseconds. Standard deviation off the two and a half millisecond hit with all with four EKFs, mag fusion, GPS fusion, three IMUs, the whole kit and caboodle. And there we go now to three microsecond, four microsecond standard deviation. It's chalk and cheese. Right? The difference between this and what we're flying now, you can we can start saying, hey, we're gonna actually hit 400 hertz, and I mean 400.000 hertz. Right? Now this also means we can... Two microseconds on the last one. <laughs> it's deviation across 10 seconds. It's just spot on. The scheduling that Shibios can do is just out of this world compared to what we could get with Nutx. Right? So it also means we can start pushing this thing at higher loop rates. We've got spare CPU, we've got precise scheduling. So Leonard's done flights at what, 800 hertz and a kilohertz? Kilohertz, so, yeah. kilohertz flights on a copter, on a FMU V3. Right? Running our loop rate at a kilohertz, which is totally different. You know, 400 hertz to a kilohertz, it makes an enormous difference on a copter of this size. So then the next level, we've got plans heading the, the rate loops towards four kilohertz and the, then separating off the other loops. So we really think we're going to start pushing our loop rates up into the multi kilohertz region. But none of that can happen unless the underlying RTOS is going to do what we ask it to do. When we want things to happen then, they happen then. Not at some time, you know, half a, a couple of milliseconds later. All right, so there you go. Uh, just wanted to demonstrate that it's got uh, all the fusion stuff turned on, etc. And uh, and of course, if we were running a companion computer, 
uh, it would be a massive impact on it with the current one, but with this, hardly the impact at all, because that's all DMA. So virtually no impact. So, uh, back to our talk. Okay, faster main loops. So I've mentioned we're going to go push up. To, we've already done flights at one kilohertz. We've got plans in place um, to, in the longer term, get up to four kilohertz rate loops, which we think will be really fantastic for certain classes of vehicles. All right, so current status, where are we at? And when are you gonna get all this stuff? Well, it's in master now. Um, we have, it's been easy to port to a new board. One of the things I liked was when Tom landed at the airport and the FedEx guy arrived at my front door with a crazy flight too. Um, and uh, so uh, I wanted to get the crazy fly two bo booting IG pilot before he got to the hotel and had a shower. And we did it. We had up and booting and photographic evidence before he managed to have a shower. So it shows how long he spends in the shower. Um, <laughs> but porting to a new board was quick and easy. I brought up the schematic. I typed in the pin numbers from the schematic. I ran it through the build in Shib Hal Shibios Pilot, and hey presto, it loads, boots, and there it is. Now the barrow wasn't working till after he got out of the shower, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, it was pretty good, it was booting at least. Um, so we've got FMU V3, FMU V4, Crazy Fly 2, Sky Viper 2450, Sky Viper F412, Revo Mini and Mini Pix at the moment in master, and more are being added. Uh, porting to a new board is no longer a cause for major concern. Um, so, missing features. There are bits miss, piece, uh, pieces missing. We don't yet have FMU V1, the old PX4 V1. We need to add that one. It's just for completeness, because we do support in our current one. We should support it in the next one. VR Braid P4 Pro. I could have done those myself. I've been deliberately waiting for um, Luke, Mike, and... Um, Kevin, thank you. Kevin from Drotech to work on these, and they say they plan to port those across. In long term, we'll remove Hal VR Brain, and he'll just be Hal Shibios, uh, and the P4 Pro will just be a another HWDEF dot that for that board. And it should be nice and quick and easy to maintain those. Uh, we haven't yet done the port of the IO microcontroller firmware to Shibios. Uh, that's we're using our existing IO microcontroller firmware, which is against raw NUTX. Uh, it's not a huge job, just Sid or I will do it at some stage when we get the, the time for a moment to do that. Um, we don't yet have Serial 5 support in FMU V3. Again, not, not all that hard. We just need to do it. We need to interact with Printf to get the interaction correct there. We don't have PWM-based range finders because we don't have the PWM input driver for that. Well, we have a PWM input driver, but not hooked into the range finder code on Chibios. It's got if, def, px4 stuff around it. We need to fix that. And we don't have things like remote upgrade of GPS and radios, which will we use the, the Mavlink serial carrying over to do that. So that's where we're at. Um, that's probably enough on operating systems for today. So any questions? No? Okay. So the future is Shibios uh, for STM32. Uh, Tom? Yeah, the question. Uh, so you said these are missing features and they're on your to-do list. Yeah. What's the time frame of that? Um, I, what, I, what I think we're going to be doing is... Like shower again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're another long shower. Yeah. Uh, these will be knocked off one at a time as, as, as we have time to do it. But what I expect we'll, we'll probably do is future stable releases of Copter, Plane, Rover, you know, Sub, etc. Probably should come out now with Shibuya support for the boards that we don't have any support for them under PX4 at all. So why not? you know, say, we support it right now and get those out. So for those boards, the answer is now. We start doing those as part of our stable builds, right? For FMU V3, FMU V2, FMU V4, we have to be absolutely feature complete, right? Which means they're gonna be probably three, four months, something like that, before we can start considering it. And that has to intersect with the release cycle, the testing cycle. We need lots and lots of testing. So one of the things that I would like to come out of this talk is you all being enthused to go and run Shibios on your boards and fly it, right? Lots and lots of Shibios flying is what we want um, because we want to make sure that it is absolutely rock solid. And we can do lots of bench testing. Mark Whitehorn's been doing a lot of soap testing. It's been incredibly valuable, but we need more of it. And we need people, the core dev team need to run their vehicles of Shibios to make sure that everything's good. 
All right. Does that answer the question? Are you ready? Yeah. Um, you mentioned a lot about the uh, you know the, the CPU speed. I was wondering about the firmware size as well because there's yeah, a lot of it's smaller. there. It's smaller. Anyway. So uh, it depends how we opt optimize it. This particular one, I actually built it for this demo with O3 for optimization because we've got two mega flash, plenty of flash. Built with O3, um, it ends up being slightly smaller than our PAL PX4 build for this board. Built with OS, which is what we normally do, it's a couple hundred K, 150 K or so smaller. Sorry, how much? 250K smaller, yeah, considerably smaller. So we've got a lot more headroom, which means on FMU V2, the original Pixel 1, we can actually have all features enabled, right, and fit. But I'd like to do the FMU V3, V2 split even so, because on FMU V3, we're not space constrained. We should actually compile the entire thing with optimization 03. It makes it bigger, but it means that Leonard can push his loop rate that little bit higher. Right, so we can get a little bit more out of the CPU because why not use, you know, for people who don't have the broken CPUs with one meg limit, start taking advantage of it. And so we'll probably keep that split even though it's not strictly necessary just to get every ounce of performance we can out of every chip that's out there. All right, Tom? Um, as far as CPU idle time or yep. CPU usage, uh, what is it now with PX4? I've been meaning to show you that. Right, so here's some performance numbers that I'll explain. What I'll do is I'll turn on uh, Shared Debug 2 with this hacked build, and it's going to start printing out some numbers here that I'll try and explain. This is some work that Mark Whitehorn's been doing on profiling, and that Sid and I have been uh, looking at very closely the last day or two, and we're still trying to understand some of it. With this copter running at 400 hertz um, with... Uh, four EKFs, Fusion, all of the bits I've talked about before, we're currently 31% idle CPU. All right? Um, but that's really pushing the chip. Now, how does that divide up? If you increase the loop rate, that doesn't increase everything. It only increases some little parts of it. Okay? Uh, it's not linear like that. So we're saying that the main Arducopter thread is using 32% of the CPU. If you double the loop rate, it doesn't go to 64, it might go to 40, right? That's because a lot of the heavy maths happens at 100 hertz or whatever rate anyway. We can see here a big ones are SPI bus transfers, and this is something that Sid and I are trying to understand because SPI 4 using 19% of the CPU and SPI 1 8%, that's more than we expected, a lot more than we expected. And Sid and I are still trying to understand why the SPI transfers are using more CPU than we expect, given they're all DMA-driven. Uh, there's something going on. Now, it's the same under Nutx. It's using about the same percentage on Nutx. There's some commonality there, um, but we don't fully understand it. So we, we will get back to you on the uh, Gitter channel or on the forums once we understand those numbers. We've only got these numbers coming out as of yesterday, so, uh, you know, give you some time to understand it. We can see things like uh, the timer using average 0%. Uh, the UARTs are using 2% of our CPU, right? Um, the USB is actually suspended, 0, right? And you can see all the tasks, the storage task, 0. If I turn on logging, the storage might go up to a percent or 2. Okay, it'll start increasing a little bit. Or again, all DMA driven. But this is the sort of stats that we're generating, and um, we're still learning how to get the most out of this and understand these numbers. But of the all, but copter, 30 odd percent idle. Plane at 50 hertz, a lot more idle. So we have a lot of CPU free, which is what Michael Dubois is planning to absorb in his talk. He gets he gets dibs on the CPU. All right. So all good. So a quick summary, this is, so 60% is what it's using now, or 70 We're 400 hertz with copter with four EKFs and absolutely maxed out. Yes. So, yeah, so, can you, so this is with Chibios? Chibios. Can you compare that to what it is with, uh, with two EKFs with PX4? Like, so what we're using It, it uses more. The, the, the big thing actually, the total CPU use of genetics is higher, but the big thing is the timing genetics. We, we have to... We have to keep, we can't use more than like half the CPU on NUTX, otherwise the jitter gets crazy. Because as the CPU usage goes up, the jitter goes up much faster. It must be a square law or something, right? I'm not sure what the theoretical law is, but we can't use most of our CPU under NUTX, otherwise the jitter gets completely unacceptable. It's the accuracy of the timing under Shibios that allows us to use almost all the CPU without the timing jitter going crazy. 
and uh, autos in general, like when we are dealing with these things, we are not trying to be fast, but we are trying to be on time. So yes. it's not the time like we want to spend in CPU that doesn't matter, but we want to be on time. You know, like when we say we are going to yeah. run in one second, we need to be running in one second, not 1.2 second or 1.3 second. Even though like you know the process is happening faster, like in Linux machine, we have more time there to you know do things, but it's never on time as we are on the microcontroller. That's the, you know, yeah, the and there is the possibility. We do have some code in the tree at the moment under the Halo 4 Lite that Night Ghost did, which we could bring into Hal should be if people want to, to overclock. You could actually run these things, they're currently 168 megahertz, you can run them at 260 megahertz if you want to. So if you want more CPU and you don't mind, you know, you've got a bit of cooling there, um, or you're happy with the risk, then you can push things hard. And I'm sure that Leonard might consider that for some of his demo flights on his cheap comps. <laughs> 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 Maybe. <Yeah. laughs> All right, that's enough on, on Chibios, I think. So let's have a look at our schedule. Do people need a, a, a few minutes break? Right? Um, so next up, thank you. Thank you, Steve.